Many, many of you may remember Orly Barnett. She worked at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Centre for a number of years before making Aliyah to Israel in 2017. She is currently completing her Master's in Holocaust Studies at the University of Haifa. For centuries, Jews around the world have celebrated the festival of Passover or Pesach by reading from the traditional Jewish text, the Haggadah. The Haggadah tells the biblical story of the exodus of the Israelites from ancient Egypt and their freedom from slavery under Pharaoh. It is tradition to pass on the story of redemption from generation to generation, the Dovador. All these talk tonight, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Germany, the Passover Haggadah and the Holocaust, explores Pesach Haggadah before, during, and in the aftermath of the Holocaust. With limited resources and under extreme circumstances, whether in concentration camps, in hiding, or in displaced persons camps after liberation, Jews continue to find ways to tell the story of their fight for freedom and of hope in such dark times. But before we start, a few housekeeping rules. For the duration of the talk, all cameras and audio will be switched off. I will be moderating the Q&A. And for ease of identifying all of your questions, please will you write them up in the Q&A section, which is at the bottom of your screen. Should anybody wish to ask Orly a question at the end of the session, you may put up your hand and we will open up your camera and audio. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Orly Barnett. Hi everyone, I'll quickly share my screen. Thank you so much, Heather, and thank you um, and the team at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center for this opportunity to speak tonight. This research project that I'll be presenting on has formed part of my master's degree in Holocaust studies at the University of Haifa in Israel. And so I would like to thank Dr. Rachel Perry for her insights and support, as well as Dr. Yael Granot, the director of the Weiss Levnat International MA program for Holocaust studies at the University of Haifa. And thank you also to my dear friend, Dan Moses, who's on the call today. He's my fellow student and research partner on this project. It's wonderful to see everyone who is attending tonight, some familiar faces. Aharon Kami was a Holocaust survivor who fought in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which took place over Passover in April, 1943. Here on the screen, he borrows from the text of the Haggadah, which traditionally tells the biblical story of the slavery of the Israelites under the Pharaoh in ancient Egypt, he says, we were slaves in the ghettos of Poland to Hitler, Fuhrer of Germany, accursed be his name. And we were taken from there to be killed and enslaved. And those who tell of the suffering of the Jews will live to see the downfall of Hitler and Nazi Germany. Just as we pass the Pesach story on from generation to generation, so too should we keep the memory of the victims of the Holocaust alive. The rise of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust deeply impacted the ways in which European Jews could observe Passover. Many Jews at risk of their own lives tried to maintain their customs and traditions. The Haggadah emerged as a tool with which to express the modern day persecution of the Jews set against the traditional biblical story of freedom from oppression. In this talk, I will be discussing the Haggadah in relation to the Holocaust in four parts. The Haggadah during the rise of Nazi Germany, the Haggadah during the years of the Holocaust, the Haggadah in the DP camps of post-war Europe, and the Haggadah on Kibbutzim in pre-state Israel. Each um, was man manifested in different ways. After the Nazi party rose to power in Germany in 1933, some artists used the Passover Haggadah to express their alarm over the treatment of Jews at the hands of the Nazis, which they compared to the biblical story of oppression by the ancient Egyptians. Arthur Sheik, who you can see in a picture here on the screen, a highly regarded Jewish artist from Poland, created the Sheik Haggadah in the mid 1930s. His exquisite, intricate illustrations retold the Passover story in a contemporary context and held many anti Nazi themes. 
Sheik later escaped to the United States where he became known as a soldier in art for his prolific anti-Nazi political and satirical artwork. Sheik's mother and brother were murdered during the Holocaust. This is an early caricature by Arthur Sheik, created soon after Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Here, Sheik equates Hitler to the biblical Pharaoh who oppressed the Jews in ancient Egypt. And you can see the caricature here. He made it clear that he, the, of the danger he felt the Jews of Europe faced under the Nazi regime. This satirical sketch would soon be followed by Sheik's masterpiece, the Sheik Haggadah. And now I'd like to show you three pages from this Haggadah. The first is called The Four Sons. The Haggadah traditionally tells of the four sons at the Passover Haggadah or fest, uh, Passover Seder or festive meal. Um, you can see here the four sons depicted. One is wise, one is wicked, one is simple, and one who is inarticulate or does not know how to ask as it is written in the Haggadah. In his Haggadah, Sheik depicts the wise son, which you can see in the corner top right, as a noble Jewish scholar. He's wearing scholarly clothes, he's got a beard and peyot. While the wicked son, which you can see opposite him on the top left-hand corner, holds a whip, wears Germanic clothes in opposition to the, the wise son, and he has a moustache resembling that of Adolf Hitler. This is another page from the Sheik Haggadah. In the center of this page, Sheik depicts an Egyptian striking an Israelite slave. Between them in the center is the word maror in Hebrew. Maror is a bitter herb eaten on Passover and it symbolizes the bitter years of slavery in Egypt. Sheik had painted a Nazi swastika on the red armband of the Egyptian. You can see the arm that is down in the front, the left-hand arm, but was forced to remove it by his publishers. He then replaced it with a circular emblem seen here and used this emblem throughout his Haggadah to signify the Nazis. So here you can see that. This page is called The Bread of Affliction. Sheik highlights a well-known verse in the Haggadah, Hashanah Hacha, um, as his hope for European Jews. It says, now we are slaves, next year we will be free. At the bottom, an eagle is stretched out, and that is a symbol of Nazi Germany. It watches over Jewish slaves, both in ancient Egypt and in contemporary times. At the top, you can see a Jewish soldier who is fighting a beast. Both animals, the beast and the, and the eagle at the bottom, bear a circular emblem. That's the emblem that Sheik used in place of the Nazi swastika. Now, moving on, also the Haggadah is a warning. Shortly after the outbreak of World War II in 1939, a group of young, young German Jewish refugees also attempted to use the Haggadah as a warning naming Hitler as the Pharaoh of Germany who had enslaved the Jewish people. While imprisoned in the Atlit detention camp in 1940 for attempting to immigrate illegally to British mandate Palestine, they created their own non-traditional Haggadah. They used the story of the exodus from Egypt to tell their own story of their escape from Nazi Germany towards the state of Israel and warned of Hitler's oppression of Jews in Europe. They began their Haggadah with the words, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Germany. This is the second section, under the shadow of the Holocaust. After the Nazi occupation of Poland and the outbreak of war in 1939, Jews across Europe found themselves caught in an ever expanding web of terror. Under extreme conditions and with limited resources, Jews in hiding or in camps attempted to produce Haggadot and did so with great care and artistic creativity. Most were written from memory and attempted to stay true to the tr traditional text of the Haggadah so as to complete the mitzvah or the commandment of reading the Passover story. This will change in later sections. Dr. Pinka Sigmund Rothschild, who survived the Goethe detention camp in France, recalls, before Goethe, we had led a carefree existence and had not attempted to truly understand or remember the miracle of the exodus from Egypt, from slavery to freedom. Now it was as if that which befell our nation in those distant days became part of our everyday existence. This is also a Haggadah from Goethe's detention camp. 
Arya Ludwig Zuckerman painstakingly created this Haggadah from memory under harsh conditions at the Gros detention camp in France in 1941. The painted scene that you can see is by Fritz Schleifer, depicting a rare Passover ceremony that was allowed to actually take place in the camp. It really happened. And it was led by Rabbi Yehuda Leo Ansbacher. Copies of this Haggadah were later smuggled out of the camp. Fritz Schleifer, the artist, was murdered at Auschwitz-Birkenau in 1942. Arya Zuckerman, the writer of the Haggadah, and Rabbi Leo Ansbacher survived the war. You can see a picture of Rabbi Ansbacher in the top right corner of the screen. This Haggadah was created by Eli Melek Landau at age, nine, at age 17, while in hiding with his family in Poland. His father recited the pages from memory and Eli Melech drew scenes of the Passover story, including Moses, which you can see in his cover, leading the Jews through the desert towards Jerusalem and to freedom. The Landau survived the war thanks to Anna uh, Koshitoko, who hid them in her home. While in hiding with his family members in Belgium in March 1944, Ephraim Zeev Yakont prepared this Haggadah on a piece of paper as a teenager. It included includes illustrations of the ingredients found on the traditional Seder plate. Ephraim survived the war thanks to the Dubois family who hid him with, his, with their family in their house, with his family in their house. However, many other family members perished during the Holocaust. Here we see two covers that are very similar. The Haggadah on the left is thought to have been published secretly by members of the Dutch underground in 1943. The illustration of the flag of Free State Israel is flying above hand, handcuffed arms, and it echoes the Passover story of the Exodus from the land of Israel. Interestingly, a year later, the Hechalot's Jewish youth movement in Switzerland used the same illustration for their Haggadah, and we don't know how they knew and how they obtained it. But as you can see on the right, they too expressed a concern for the Jews of Europe and called for their liberation. This is not quite a Haggadah, but I thought it was an interesting story to include. During the German occupation of Italy in 1944, a Catholic priest, Don Tantalo, hid seven members of the Arabiato and Pacifici families. Tantalo created this calendar to help them determine the dates of the Passover that year. He also provided them with Passover ingredients and matzah, which is the unleavened bread, to help them keep the mitzvot of the Chag. Yad Vashem recognized him as a righteous among the nations in 1978. And this is a picture of him with the families that he saved. And the picture is from before the war. These dishes were carved by Moshe Mutzva. You can see him in the picture here. A Polish Jew while sheltering in France on forged Aryan documents. The word maror or bitter herb is engraved with a phrase adapted from the Haggadah. The adaption says, this is the bread of affliction that we ate in the land of France in the days of Hitler the wicked. Moshe and his family survived the war. However, his siblings and their families all perished. This special prayer was written in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in 1944 before it was liberated. It, al it allowed Jewish inmates to eat chametz, which is the leavened bread during Passover, in order to avoid starvation. And we know this is very special because in order to keep the commandment of Pesach, one avoids leavened bread. The writer of the prayer, Rabbi David, set an example for fellow prisoners in Bergen-Belsen by eating a small piece of bread himself. He and his son died shortly before liberation. His wife, Erica, and their two daughters survived. The third section of my presentation is called From Slavery to Freedom. After liberation, Holocaust survivors were faced with enormous challenges in rebuilding their lives. Their homes and families had been destroyed and many with nowhere to go were forced to remain in displaced persons or DP camps in Europe. The Haggadot created by survivors in their first ever post-war pass over Seder reflect their pain and suffering they draw on parallels between the biblical parts of the story and their own traumatic experiences under the Nazi regime. Through these Haggadot, survivors could once again gather together and find a semblance of hope amidst the uncertainty that lay ahead. Dr. Chesi Amur, creator of the uh, sorry, curator at the National Library of Israel said about the survivors, 
They had just lived through their own slavery. It had happened to them. The new texts of the Haggadah, and he means the texts in the BP camps, formed a bridge between the timeless tale and the story being played out before their eyes. So I'd like to show you um, four pages from the same Haggadah. It's a prominent example of a post-war Haggadah in the DP camps, and it is called the Survivor's Haggadah. It was created by two Holocaust survivors, a Lithuanian teacher called Josef Dov Scheinson and a Hungarian artist called Zvi Miklos Adra. It was published by the American Third Army at the DP camp at ADP camp in Munich, Germany in 1946. So this Haggadah, the Survivor's Haggadah, makes use of traditional Haggadah texts and it juxtaposes striking imagery made in uh, the wood of the screen can see on the left hand side of the double page spread. You can see a big letter in the illustrations. At the top of the bet, there's an illustration of Egypt. Um, and at the bottom, there's an illustration of what looks like a, a scene from a death camp. There's barbed wire, um, a guard tower, and even uh, smoking crematoria at the bottom of the letter. The phrase, Bechol Dorvador, which is what the bet starts that phrase, Bechol Dorvador, is taken from the traditional Haggadah, and it instructs each reader to see themselves as if they personally were freed from slavery in Egypt. And you can see why that was a poignant use of the, of the phrase. On the right-hand side of this double-page spread, you can see the woodcut. Underneath it, in Hebrew, it says, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And it accompanies this image depicting Jews doing forced labor in a Nazi concentration camp. Another page from this Haggadah is called Dayenu. Dayenu, translated traditionally as it would have been enough, is traditionally a song of gratitude for God's miracles in the Passover story. For example, it would have been enough if he had taken them out of Egypt, it would have been enough if he had just given them manna in the desert. However, this version is written a little bit differently on the left-hand side. It bitterly lists all the persecutions against the Jews that God did allow, for example, the Crusades, blood libels, inquisitions, pogroms, Hitler, and the gas chambers, among many others. On the right-hand side of the double-page spread, you can see an image of victims being separated by Nazi guards, selected either for forced labor on the one side or being sent to their deaths on the other. On the left-hand side, you can see a scene depicting Jews performing backbreaking slave labor under the watch of a Nazi guard. It is accompanied by a line from the traditional Haggadah in Hebrew, and they oppressed us and imposed hard labor upon us. On the right-hand side is a text. It, it accuses the world of remaining silent while Hitler persecuted the Jews of Europe and annihilated them in the gas chambers that he built. And the last page from the Survivor's Haggadah that I'll share today. In the image on the left, the dismembered heads of Jewish victims appear in the flames of the crematorial chimneys. A group of survivors below, their world destroyed, appears to have nowhere to go. In the sky at the top of the image are Hebrew words. They say the biblical phrase, lech lecha el ha'aretz, which in which in the biblical story, Abraham is told by God to go to the land of Canaan. It appears in this image that it is implying to survivors that their salvation also lies in immigration to Israel. Moving on to a different Haggadah in the post-war European DP camps. This is uh, from Landsberg DP camp. Um, and at Landsberg, they had their own newspaper and this newspaper published this Haggadah for the camp's first Passover after liberation. This copy belonged to a survival Mendel, Mendel Horowitz who survived Auschwitz, and you can see that written at the bottom of the page. Again, you see a depiction of slavery in Egypt on the top left of the page in the corner, there's some um, um, uh, pyramids. And on the top right, it is again compared to a Nazi concentration camp where you can see a guard tower and barbed wire. A ray of light breaks through the chains and shines onto a pastoral scene, presumably the land of Israel. This Haggadah was prepared by members of the Jewish youth movement, Havonim Dror, for Holocaust survivors in Hungary. 
On the right, you can see the traditional text from the Haggadah, Behold of our door, which is very common in these Haggadahs. It is accompanied again by illustrations of the Jewish people being persecuted both by the ancient Egyptians, which you can see at the top of the page, they're being herded towards the uh, pyramids. And at the bottom of the page, a group of Jewish victims being herded into a concentration camp um, by the Nazis. But then on the illustration on the left of the page, you can see souls of Jewish victims which are flying out the chimneys of the crematoria next to the inscription in Hungarian saying, you are the remnants of destruction. This Haggadah includes a mourner's prayer. It says at the top in Hebrew, nizkor, which means what we shall remember. It commemorates the thousands of souls destroyed by the Nazis because of their Jewish origin. It also recognizes the suffering in the ghettos and in hiding and the bravery of the Jewish partisans during the Holocaust. It was published by the Refugee Center and Culture Department of Hechalot Zachad in Rome, Italy. And the last one for this section, uh, the Viennese illustrator, Sigmund Faust, fled to America in 1939, just in time before the war broke out. And he created this Haggadah in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust from the United States. The phrase, this year we are slaves, accompanies a timeline of anti-Jewish persecution. So you can see on the right-hand side, um, an image of ancient Egyptians. And then all the way behind them is a timeline of persecution, including the Crusades, expulsions, inquisition, um, through all, all ages, up until on the bottom left-hand side, you can see a Nazi guard. And uh, on the left-hand side in the corner, you can see an SS soldier standing over a Jew wearing an armband. And uh, in our research, we came to think that this might mean uh, a reference to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which took place on Passover in 1943. The last section of my talk is called Exodus to the Land of Israel. Jewish refugees from Europe gathered on kibbutzim or agricultural settlements in British Mandate Palestine, which was pre-state Israel. And after the war, they were joined by survivors of the Holocaust. There, they created their own non-traditional secular Haggadot to use at the Passover Seder. These non-traditional secular kibbutz Haggadot discard both the familiar Passover text and the imagery about slavery in Egypt. And this is where we see a big departure. Instead, they make use of biblical texts referring to the destruction of the Jewish people or they create completely original poetry and lamentations. As more and more details became available after the war, the creators of these Haggadots attempted to grapple with the aftermath of the Holocaust. Their illustrations do not shy away from depicting the horrors of the Nazi regime. In 1948, Passover Haggadah from Kibbutz Kapar Shmayahu in Israel reads, and we are here, we did not wander to the diaspora, but have returned to our homeland, in this case, Israel. It is our obligation to tell, of the to tell of the people of Israel who came out of slavery and who will build our freedom. So the first one is a Haggadah created just prior to the end of the war in 1944, but it already grapples with the Holocaust. You can see camp inmates hanging from gallows and dead on electric fences. The text called Berama Nishma is from prophets, not from the traditional Haggadah, but from the Bible, and it highlights the modern day suffering. It says, a voice is heard on high, wailing, bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children. She refuses to be consoled, for they are gone. This non-traditional Haggadah is thought to be attributed to the Jewish Brigade, the Yale Transportation Unit of 468, with illustrations alluding to Jewish victims and camp crematoria. An original poem adapts the list of Passover plagues to reflect the current times. It says, my brothers on the road, in the swamps, in the forest, in the dark, shaking, chased by flames, plague, fear, rain, snow, storms, and hail. Also from the same Haggadah, this poem lists countries where the Holocaust took place, such as Poland, Romania, France, Netherlands, and Belgium. It includes the following lament. Such a madness that words are meaningless. The 20th century has devastated my people. Days, years, and centuries will pass until we fully comprehend 
what was carried out here so suddenly. The illustrations depict a German Wehrmacht soldier and Jewish victims. The first post-war Haggadah of Kibbutz Hagarin includes an illustration of a concentration camp that you can see in the middle of the page. An extract from the traditional Echa lamentation from the Bible highlights the destruction of the Jewish people in contemporary times. A queen has come, has become a slave. Her, ally, her allies have betrayed her and become her enemies. An original passage follows at the bottom, lamenting being abandoned by God without being avenged. This illustration appears to reference the Nazi book burnings of 1933, over 10 years prior to creation, and the quote by the 19th century German Jewish poet Heinrich Hein that says, where they burn books, they will also ultimately burn people. The accompanying text laments, we have not been answered, we carry in our hearts the rage of our torture and the vision of our resurrection from generation to generation. Traditional imagery of ancient Egypt is replaced here by an illustration of the crematorium and a mound of skeletons, some of whom appear to be moving. A poem of despair asks, will the bones come back to life? Come from Treblinka, Sobibor, Auschwitz, Belgic, Connery, and endless more. Cry out from the marshes, bones of the people of Israel rise from the dust. And to conclude this section, even after the State of Israel was declared in 1948, the Haggadah was still used to commemorate the Holocaust. A scene of destruction over here on this page is of the Warsaw Ghetto, and it is depicted in the first Passover Haggadah of Kibbutz Lochamea Ghetto Ot, the ghetto fighters kibbutz. The Haggadah was for survivors by survivors, many of whom had fought in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising on Passover, April 1943. In recalling preparations for Passover in the ghetto, Holocaust survivor Lena Quint remembers. In the physical and psychological suffering of the ghetto, the week when we celebrated our deliverance from Egypt as slaves, there was still a symbol of hope. And to conclude, Passover returns each year in the spring, the season of renewal and birth. The Haggadah continues to be a tool for reflection and interpretation, highlighting the theme of redemption from slavery in all generations, for all peoples, and in all parts of the world. In some modern Haggadot, a fifth child is added to the traditional text of the four sons. This fifth child represents the 1.5 million Jewish children who perished in the Holocaust and who cannot be present at a Seder today. We honor them in this week of Passover. At every Passover Seder, we ask the age-old question, Manish Tana, why is tonight different from all other nights? And for every participant, the answer may differ. But the festival of Passover and the Haggadah in all its incarnations provides an opportunity to reflect on the freedoms we want to see in our world today and in the future. Thank you. Ori, that was truly wonderful um sure i think sobering and and understanding as and as richard friedman had said in the chat um the hugger daughter like journals or diaries of their experience what made you decide to choose this particular subject thanks heather thanks richard um, so it's an interesting question, actually. Um, as you mentioned, I used to work at the Holocaust Center in Cape Town before I made Aliyah. And when I was presented with the opportunity to do this project, um, the topic was art in extremis or art made under extreme conditions during the Holocaust. And it could really be any topic under that banner. And I thought to myself about working in the center and um, artistic representations that stood out to me. And I remember that during Pesach, we would always send out a Passover greeting using imagery that was made during the Holocaust, during Passover. And sometimes they also included photographs. 
And so um, my friend Dan, who did this project with me, uh, we discussed it and we discussed the idea of artistic representation during all festivals. So that included Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, uh, Purim in the ghettos and all other Jewish festivals under the Holocaust. Um, and we started doing research, uh, found that there was lots to uh, present. And so we decided to stick with one theme um, of the Haggadah. Okay, well, in fact, Rebecca Soriano, um, in fact, asked the question. Um, I'd like to ask why, how Oli got interested in the different types of, of Haggadot. Hi, Rebecca. Rebecca is a fellow uh, student um, in the MA program from Brazil. She's tuning in all the way from Brazil. Okay, let me have a look in the, the chats. Um, because there's been quite a few different things, some, some compliments from Shirley Newick. Thank you, Orly, for a very moving presentation. Um, Sharon Geffen um, says, reminds one of Munch. I'm not too sure what she means here. Do, do you know? Maybe we can ask her to ask the question or to explain. Um, yes, if she could explain, that would be great. Okay, Sharon, if you, um, if you would like to talk a little bit further with Orly about that, can we just open Sharon's um, camera and her, and her sound? Um, let me see if I can find her. Hmm, I can't find her here. Maybe she's on another thing. Can you just put up your hand, Sharon, if you are with us? I'm here. I'm oh, here. good. Here I am. <laughs> Hello, everyone. That was wonderful. Um, Munch is the famous Norwegian artist who painted the scream. Oh, Munch, yes. Yes, yes. So, um, so those woodcuts, you know, um, reminded me very much of that that horror which, yes. which was to depict the Holocaust to come. And I thought how you know superbly appropriate in the circumstances. That's absolutely right. Um actually um as far as I know Munch was a German expressionist and so yes. perhaps they had a similar um, yes he also uh, used woodcuts um and okay and um was was part of that as you said, German expressionist group. I think he was born in Norway, but um, there's a big exhibition there. So thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca has asked another question. Are you publishing this project in print or in a digital form? Um, so no plans to publish it in print yet. Um, also, um, because it's a project that was done under the auspices of the University of Haifa, we were allowed to use images um, from different archives across any digital platform, but without, you know, as long as you reference them, it's fine, but I'm not sure if it goes into print, if there are different uh, rights involved. Um, in terms of online, so um, I think we will be sharing it on the University of Haifa website. I will try to get it shared there. Right, okay, so some compliments, um, Orly, from Sandra Hoffman. Many thanks for such an interesting talk, Kola Kavod. Um, Melvin Greenstein, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, from Shirley Newick, thank you, Orly, for a very moving presentation. Um, Orly, I mean, you must have found a number of Haggadot while you were doing your research. So what made you choose the Haggadot that you did? So I think when we both, Dan and I started doing the research, um, Dan is Israeli and so he was incredibly helpful and insightful when it came to Haggadot in Hebrew. And there were a lot of things that I think I personally would have missed. Um, but with his translations, we were able to say, um, okay, we see connections here, for example, um, uh, talking about plagues, but modern day plagues, or talking about Dayenu, but in modern times. Um, and so those really stuck out to us and we thought it was worth sharing. 
Um, and slowly, as we collaborate, uh, put together all of our different um, sources, we started to realize that they fit into categories of pre-war, um, Nazi Germany and Haggadot at that time, um, Haggadot during the Holocaust. And I will say also that we found it very difficult to find um, examples of Haggadot made during the Holocaust. And this differs from Haggadot that people might have brought with them into ghettos, for example, that they had pre, you know, been printed before the, the outbreak of the war that they had brought with them. But I'm talking about particularly Haggadot that were made in the time of the Holocaust from scratch. Um, and I think this might just be attributed to the fact that it was so hard to come by resources to create a Haggadah. Um, and yes, some people managed to do it in hiding with the small amount of resources that they had and with enormous creativity and resourcefulness. And it was fascinating to see that in these cases, the Haggadot tried to stay very faithful to the original text. Then later we found that other Haggadot that we were looking at strayed away from the original text, away from traditional imagery from the Haggadah of slavery. And then that's how we decided to include those ones because it was quite shocking to us that um, Haggadot in post-war Europe and in, in Israel, pre-state of Israel, um, were so visceral in their imagery. And these were not uh, Arthur Sheik illustrators and publishers. These were not um, top artists. These were like Haggadot being made for the layperson from members of a kibbutz or members of a DP camp that were just drawing with their heart, not necessarily um, famous artists or illustrators and using their words and their imagery to try and grapple with the, the vast disruptive nature of the post-Holocaust fallout. And so we felt that we should definitely um, include them, even the ones in Hebrew that we can't necessarily translate the whole thing. Uh, some are also in Yiddish, I'll say, and German and Hungarian. Um, one thing we did not include, which we only found out after we finished the project, was that there were also Haggadot in Yiddish that mocked Hitler. And um, a couple of weeks ago, the National Library of Israel presented a talk on these Haggadot in Yiddish. Okay. So Rich, Richard is, has been enthralled by your talk. Um, a few things that he's had to say, your talk would make a great paper for publication, and, and I agree. Um, he also remarks on the symbol reminds me of the picture we have of Italian Jews in the original ghetto with peat cap and circles on their clothing. I think that there is... Um, there is something to be said between when people were illustrating their modern day Haggadot, how they were referring to other tropes and other symbolism and other ways of representing Jews from all the way back to the Middle Ages. So I think if, if, if Richard is referencing um, how Jews were depicted um, with triangles or with patches on their clothes, then perhaps uh, Arthur Sheik, who created the Sheik Haggadah, that's a very interesting point, was perhaps doing a reversal and saying, well, I will also mark the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from Linda Heckner, thanks for a fascinating talk, Orly. Um, from Kathy Barnett, for like a vod, Orly, for the most moving. I'm <laughs> Historical documentation of Haggadot through the time of the Holocaust and post Second War, World War. Hugely enlightening. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, when you have a look at it, and, and we know that it's gone from generation to generation, but I think the fascinating thing here was being able to depict a period in our history that shouldn't be forgotten, just as we shouldn't forget about being um, our freedom from Egypt, we shouldn't forget about what happened during the Holocaust. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I really want to thank Dan, my partner who did this project with me for pointing that out. I think it was Dan who originally said, wait, we have something special here because it is the Haggadah that through centuries, not only around the Holocaust, but even prior to the Holocaust and post Holocaust, that is a tool that can depict current day situations through the story, the biblical story of slavery and freedom from oppression. 
Um, and so it really has been like a remarkable insight into, um, yeah, artifacts that depicting that that depict the time while still referencing Jewish traditions. And how difficult was it for, for you to find all of these artifacts? Were were um, were universities, um, Holocaust centers willing to to help? So obviously with COVID um, being a problem around the world, we weren't able to visit any archives. Um, luckily, a lot of uh, museums around the world have started to digitize everything and put their archives online for public use. And our two major sources here, I would say, were the Yad Vashem uh, archive and the Ghetto Fighters, Wakamea Geta Ot, their archive. Um, so a lot of the Haggadot that you saw in the presentation during the war uh, come from the Yad Vashem archive. Um, they have an online exhibition themselves called And You Shall Tell Your Children, and it includes some of these um, artifacts, some of these pages, and also a lot of photographs. Um, and Yad Vashem has always been a great source um, for archival material. Um, Locha Meha Geta Ot was also at the Ghetto Fighters Museum, also a great resource for Kibbutz Hagadot. Um, and then strangely, a very unexpected source um, was online auction house websites for post, um, post war kibbutz Hagadot. So it seems that there is a collection of kibbutz, not, they call it a non traditional Haggadah, which is how I described it as abandoning traditional Haggadah imagery and text. Um, so there is a digital um, and archival collection of this with the National Library of Israel. Um, but it also seems, and I wasn't able to investigate it further, but it seems that these have adult also exist in private collections. And so this is what we found online in these auction house websites. And uh, that was really surprising. Mm -hmm. And, and at what stage do you think that it reverted back to the Haggadot that we know today? Um, I think all of the Haggadot contain or make use of traditional lines and imagery that we say even today at the, uh, at the Pesach Seder, even this week. Um, so I just found it fascinating that people in every section of this research were able to reference the same lines that everyone says around the world. It doesn't matter what country you are in the world, everybody is reciting the same text. So that was really fascinating to me. And uh, my gran, who was on the call, actually after she saw this presentation, she um, bought out a 100-year-old Haggadah, um, which belonged to her granny, if I'm not mistaken, as a child in Cape Town. Um, it's, a, it's a printed Haggadah, I think from New York originally, and it has images in it. It's, not, it's a traditional Haggadah, but it was just fascinating to see that this research sort of can apply to any generation and any anyone who practices Pesach, the tradition of Pesach around the world. Orly Pat Jacobson says, thank you, Orly, for this very interesting information and wonderful to see you from Pat J. Wonderful um, to see you too, Pat. <laughs> Um, Diane Joachim, thank you, Audi, for such an interesting talk. So nice to see you again. Well, I think, Audi, it, it has really been wonderful having you here with us. Um, you've just exposed us to a whole new world that, that maybe we didn't know. We knew some of the stuff. Um, and well done to you and Dan for all of the work and the research. And I think this becomes a very important um, part of, of our history that we need to, to maybe expand on. So maybe your project isn't finished. Maybe it's just the beginning of a far bigger project. Who knows? And if anyone has any additional sources, their own family, uh, like a dot something in their own family collection, maybe they could get in touch with you and it would be great to know what else is out there. And thank you again for this opportunity. Okay, so thank you to, to the team who was working tonight behind the scenes, to Aria and Justine. Thank you, Oli, for talking to us from Israel, which was really wonderful. Be safe. From quarantine. And from quarantine. And to all of our um, participants, our friends who joined us, thank you very much. There will be a recording that you can watch. Um, be safe um, and be healthy. Goodbye. Thanks.